Good afternoon. And welcome back to LinuxConf Australia 2012 um, in the CWO One Room and in another so like, um, addition to our studies on various uh, on file systems, etc. Um, we have Kate Stewart. Very honoured to have Kate Stewart here. Uh, Kate Stewart is Ubuntu's release manager, manager prior to working or joining Canonical to work with Ubuntu. She managed teams uh, doing um, open source development for the Power Architect Architecture at um, uh, Freescale uh, Semiconductor, where she was there um, for the previous 10 years. Um, she's also worked with developers in Freescale to help them able to provide code distributions to the community for Linux, the GNU compiler, and the U-Boot projects, which was a lot of fun. Um, Kate is talking on data mining packages to assess update risks. Um, and I'm sure that you'll be able to give Kate a very warm welcome to Linux Conference Australia 2012. Kate Stewart. Thank you. Uh, my first question is, uh, how many people here are running Ubuntu? Awesome. How many people here are running Precise? OK. This is on Precise. So, um, we haven't hit Alpha 2 yet, but it's looking pretty solid, so I figured it was worth a shot of doing the presentation that way. Anyhow, um, to give you a bit of a background, I came into this role about a year ago. Oops, we had some feedback, okay. <laughs> um, and prior to that, I'd been working on a distribution that had about 500 packages, um, and we changed the kernels, the compiler, you know, compilers, the bootloaders. That's what we'll be changing on a regular basis. Um, but there's only about 500 packages. You know, you might change one or two each cycle. And then all of a sudden, I hit Ubuntu. And um, right now, in Precise, there's uh, 7,130 packages in the images that are actively part of the images. And the entire archive has um, 19,273 packages. And these are all changing pretty much daily um, with the imports. Or they were changing pretty much daily up until last week when we um, stopped the auto-import freeze. Well, we had the um, Debian auto import. We froze that now. But there's a tremendous rate of change, which was quite a different dimension. And I started looking like, OK, um, when's it safe? When's it not? OK. And it all sort of worked. But I was trying to get a feel for what was happening and why things were changing. So this talk is uh, about some of the things I've been finding out. And it isn't a solution. It is, here's the problem space, and I'm sort of I've had good experience with coming to LCA in the past. I'm sort of hoping that other people might have some ideas of things I've not looked at yet. Um, so, but let me set the context of where we are, and then we can go from there. So packages in Ubuntu are coming from many, many sources. Um, a large number of open source projects are feeding into Debian, and then as well as commercial um, contributions. And then um, Debian's basically Ubuntu is pulling in from the Debian ecosystem. And it's auto-pulling in for a good part of the release. And then after that, it is um, on a selective point by point. I'll go through the life cycle of how the project works in a few minutes. And then from the archive, we're basically putting out uh, multiple images as part of the Ubuntu project that, um, that people have different flavors and um, various aspects of the community. So Ubuntu is. Um, one part of it, but then there's all the Edge Ubuntu, Kubuntu, and various flavors along that line, which have the different interfaces and different package choices determined by their communities. And then also Linux Mint tends to derive from our package archives as well. And um, you have a, a large set of feedback loops, obviously, going on in these places. As a result, um, tremendous number of variables coming into play, and getting them all stabilized is kind of fun. So. Why do I care about the package impact and what's happening? Well, obviously I'm in release management. Therefore, I kind of want to make sure we can put a release out. Ubuntu is a time-based release. And it's mostly a function of managing the change and taking a large amount of change and narrowing it down to actually being stable. So it's something that can be on the desktop or on the someone's server, and it'll work. Um, some of these things are, you know, once we hit a freeze, can we um, add a Take a feature exception, a feature freeze exception. Someone really wants this feature in. OK, well, what's the impact? What could it break? As well as, OK, what's the risk and reward? So you're basically doing that sort of risk reward. Um, 
and understanding how much that package impacts across the ecosystem is a good part of it. The other thing is, okay, if, um, we're in the very last phases, and there's a bug fix. Okay, <laughs> one-liners, good, easy. Well, yeah, we can guess. Uh, oh, you've changed, you know, a couple hundred lines of code in there, and looks pretty snaky. Uh, what else could ripple down from that? Trying to understand the ripple. If it's a leaf node, and you've changed it, okay, you're probably gonna be fine. But if you've got a large number of things depending on you, hmm, it's, you know, can we live with it or not live with it? Good questions. How much testing can we do? What sort of regression testing should we be doing through the impact? And then, you know, um, for certain packages, if there's bugs in them, let's try to get them solved early in the cycle rather than late in the cycle um, because of the dependencies and trying to minimize that dependencies. So that's the motivation for trying to think about what's happening with the package uh, archives and the relationship between them. So just for most of you, and I, if you guys are all running Ubuntu, what happens with our development cycle is we have some different phases. Um, we start off with the planning phase, then we do feature development, and then we stabilize. That's the traditional pattern. It's a six-month cycle. It works its way through. Feature definition freeze, we pretty much know what we're going to be doing for that release. And then at Debian import freeze, this whole first part, um, what we're doing is we are auto-importing from Debian all the time. So we're not necessarily having conscious control over the changes coming in. We're just taking whatever's there in Debian. Most releases um, we'll take in from unstable. For the LTS, which is this, what 1204 is going to be, we're taking in from testing. So we auto-imported from testing all the way up until January 9th. At this point now, whenever we want to do a sync request in from Debian, um, it's an explicit. So one of the release team are doing that sync request from now until we hit feature freeze. After feature freeze, the only thing we're changing are bug fixes, unless there's a freeze exception that's been processed. So it's a fairly standard process. Again, it's a funneling down of the risk in each six month window. And to keep things, you know, making sure that we're roughly on track, we put down milestone releases throughout the ecosystem, the cycle. So anyone who's interested in more details of that, we, everything's up in public and visible. Feel free to um, look at the plans. And that sort of overview is where we're going with that. And where it, why it matters is we have different support cycles. So when it's an LTS, we're looking at supporting it, well, just now for five years at least. That just was a change that came down recently for the desktop and the server for Ubuntu itself. And um, based on the tech board discussions last month, a um, couple weeks ago, it looks like um, some of the other community projects are going to go for LTS designation as well. Um, so normally it's an 18 month cycle and then for um, every four, four it's a uh, full five years. Now when we're putting those five year ones out, any changes that we're making in that space, we've got to live with them for five years and the kernel guys get to have fun supporting them for a while, a good long time. And security guys get very, um, you know, doing updates in our supported projects. It, uh, the way we break everything down in the archive is we have a supported section of the archive as well as a unsupported. The supported um, is everything in Ubuntu and we pretty much is all sitting in main or else restricted. For the unsupported, it's universe multiverse and that means it's generally the community will be supporting it, the various communities. This, the universe is by far the biggest. I've got some numbers later to sort of show you the size of the packaging. But it's, it's containing the sources and the binaries for all the architectures. And then it, supports all the, it contains all the versions that have historically been added, as well as the, um, all the flavors as well. So it's Ubuntu, Kubuntu, Lubuntu, and so forth. So we're talking a tremendous space of images kicking in here. So specifically, there's six architectures we're covering right now. We are creating 73 images every day, um, and we're trying to keep them all active. There's smoke testing on some of the Ubuntu ones. There's 38 Ubuntu images specifically, between ARM, power, and so forth, desktop, server, cloud, as well as there are 35 flavor images going out every day too. So Edge Ubuntu, Kubuntu, and so forth. And the goal is to try to keep them all roughly working every day and then at the milestones, basically tune them up and push them. 
And then when we get to feature freeze, which I sort of showed you on that cycle, that's when we're going to decide, okay, how many images have been tested well enough that we trust that we can release them as part of the release? So uh, my standard plea is, if you are really caring about an architecture and you really want to make sure it's, the image is out there, please sign up and test it. Because <laughs> otherwise we won't put it out for some of these things. Um, and so to give you a feel for how many packages are happening, um, there's actually a bit of variation on each of the number of packages depending on the architecture here. Um, we've got, and so the, I, get, I put the high water mark up down just so you can sort of see how many packages are going into each image and what the context is going to look like. And in total, there are uh, 7,130 um, unique packages right now as of um, a couple days ago. I just basically did a, updated all the numbers based on what we're doing. It, the numbers change daily, but this is sort of about the ballpark to get a feel for where we actually are across the images. And looking at that, you can sort of see, you know, things like core are very small and they're just, and there's relationships between them. And so what I just did is a little Venn diagramming to try to sort of show what the Ubuntu part of it was like. There's similar types of Venn diagramming you can do for the Kubuntu, add Ubuntu, Ubuntu to try to sort of see the relationships between them. Um, and there's a bit of overlap and a bit of you know, differences, but for the most part there's core, there's a desktop, alternate, DVD, cloud and server images. And that sort of shows the relationship between them all. Um, like I say, in, inside core there's 102 packages. Alternate has uh, 1454, desktop has 1429, so they're about the same size. Server has 1189, a little bit smaller, and then the cloud has 394. And then the DVD has 2325 right now. Most of that's like, on top of the desktop, that's sort of the line packs and putting a full image out that way. So that's the general sort of space of what it's looking like today. And then there's, you know, I think there's like, Four packages different between the core and the server at this point in time um, that aren't in there. But one of the things I'd like to know, and uh, if anyone has suggestions, does anyone know any good Venn diagramming tools? Because <laughs> I wouldn't mind actually figuring out how to do this non-manually. <laughs> but that's another. That's one of the other problems here. Um, anyhow, so that's sort of the scope of. Um, what the context we're working from. Now, in terms of um, what's available to start analyzing from, there's a lot of raw data sources out there. Um, the first one is the project archive. There's a launch pad projects themselves. They've got a lot of information in them. The daily image builds and the list of manifest files. Um, the control file for each package. Um, the output of germinate. And then, obviously, the release team members who have been absolutely awesome in terms of their knowledge base and their willingness to share. So um, there's been a lot of rich information there. And the question is, there's lots of facts, but how do you make it into knowledge? And so that's some of the, the things we're going down right now. So to give you a feel for the archive, um, the archive is contain, um, contains all active supported projects right now. And I've highlighted what's in precise right now, um, based on the numbers you've seen. And these are all the, uh, in the different components, so main, which are our supported ones, has about 3,000, 3,300 right now. Restricted has about 12, so it's not a lot. Uh, universe has uh, 15,000, and Multiverse is 500. And if you can see, see historically through the release cycles, the last few, it's been fairly coherent. Um, gradually growing more and more with the universe, probably reflecting more of the Debian interface. As Debian's been growing, more things have been coming in from that side and people nominating them in. But we have some fairly steady growth and it's more than one can keep in one's head, let's put it that way. So I'm trying to get some of the data and work it through there. The other thing is like Launchpad itself. Um, 19273 is the total number of source packages. And yes, I checked that the last slide should all add up <laughs> to that. And yes, we are seem to be coherent. Um, we've got the differences from where we're, like I say, we're just taking them from Wheezy's testing. So we're derived from the Wheezy and what are different, what's been linked up, what's not been linked up. Gives us a feel for that. As well as what's needed to be on the packaging and so forth. And then there's more of the bugs and there's a lot more information on that page further down. I just sort of took the screenshot 
of the top level. And then, as you can see also here, the binary packages. So when these are source packages are compiled for the various architectures, 38961 is in there right now under precise. And each of the releases has their own page like that. And that tends to be the link for most of the project specific ones. And then uh, when we go about building images, um, you either inside when you actually build your ISOs, you'll get dot list files or dot, manif or dot manifest files for each of the images we're building. The list files, I just put the top 10 lines of, you know, just headed them off just to sort of show you. But you're getting basically the same information. Like look at add user, you'll see it's the same version of add user, it's just expressed differently. And so by parsing the list files and the manifest files, you can get a consistent listing of um, the packages that are happening. And I was using that up. And that was, um, it's a quick way of understanding, okay, which packages are in which image without going through the full germinate stuff. And it's a way of seeing, okay, what's changed between two images. So I can also use this and work from one manifest to the next to understand what's changed between alpha one and alpha two or between an IREC and Precise's release. It's by looking at the manifest and what's actually showing up on the images. So some of these tools are available, some of this information is available. The other thing is obviously the package control file. This is, yeah, sorry if you can't see it. I should have probably blown it up a little bit more, but I was trying to show most of the things. There's the build depends on here that show up, as well as the depends, suggest, replaces, and some places there's conflicts. That is what gives you the whole relationship between all the packages. And so each of the packages having this in Debian is the foundation for actually trying to pull those coherent images together. And the way we tend to do it is we start with something, a program called Germinate, and it starts with seeds. And the seeds um, sort of describe functionality, and then they basically work through all dependencies and resolve between dependencies to make actually the images up. So it's a process of recursively walking through the dependencies and then resolving the conflicts that make up the coherent images. And this is run, again, when you're making, when you're making the images on a daily basis. So these little things grow up. Um, these are all the seeds in Sinai chart. Um, and you can't read it for reasons. I just wanted to sort of show the scope of it. Um, there's 56 seeds right now. And zooming in a little bit so it's readable, you can sort of see the relationship between some of these seeds and these functionality that's bringing in. And then all the packages are linked into some of these, into these seeds. So again, you've got the information flowing through dependencies and you can be to have it graphically. The challenge is gonna be, how can you understand coherently when something changes, what the ripple's gonna be? Because from the last one from, as being an eye chart and a problem to look at, uh, you can imagine what that would look like with 7,000 nodes. <laughs> Not exactly usable right there. Um, the other thing that's very handy, um, once you learn about it, is um, germinate has output files are reverse dependencies. And if for, and basically, as it's building everything together, it basically spits out a one file for every package. Well, there's a directory for every package and then potentially related files inside there or one file. But you basically are listing the entire reverse dependencies of what's depending on it. So that tells you to state what the impact is going to be. Um, if you change that, what do you have to sort of scan the scope of? So some of this stuff is right there out of Germinate today. And the text form. The, the challenge is understanding it in the context across um, all of the, all the 73 images. Because you've got your information per image, but then you also have the context of the 73 images. So you've got this data overlay problem that to be solved. And there are some tools right now that can help. So we've got um, our Madison, AppCache, App, our Depends, and Diff Manifest. Now, app, one of the things that confused me a lot early was um, App, our Depends is not reverse dependencies, it's recurs um, recursive, dependency, recursive depends. 
So we've got a naming collision overload space just in the proper place to confuse everyone. However, <laughs> when you're starting to look at these, so some of these um, tools, I'll just sort of go through some of them a little bit. Um, when you do an R Madison, what you're doing is for the package, you're picking out all the versions out of the archive that are active right now. So what you're doing here is, for like for Ubiquity, it's listing all the versions and it's listing the releases and it's listing what's active today and then it's saying what architectures it's available. If it's not all, it's being explicit about which architectures it's valid on. And so if there's a package that's changing and you want to sort of see, okay, what the scope of it is or which versions against which pack, you know, which archive, which sort of flavor, like, you know, these are series, like, basically it gives you a quick snapshot. And what it does is it goes off and it, you have to connect to the web for this to work and it goes and queries the where this information is out there and processes it and put it up. And so if you looked at like the ad user, you'll see that it's available on all of them. I haven't done too much. So that gives you a quick way of sort of snapshotting and seeing, okay, what is, you know, how much of historical data is potentially on a package and how much is it potentially the package change if the versioning, versioning is changing too. Uh, then there's app cache, my friend. And looking at the um, depends as well as uh, the reverse depends. And so here the reverse depends, R depends, is in the same context as germinates R depends. And it basically is giving you a feeling for um, what is going to rely on it being, this, this code being in place and the linkages being working. So those are the two. And then the show package will give you further information. So I highly encourage anyone interested in this space to do a man on app cache and uh, play around with the options. There's some kind of cool stuff in there. The other thing is app R depends. Um, there's two screens of this and it keeps on going. And it basically what it does is it takes and it follows a dependency tree all the way down um, recursively until the end nodes. So for add user, if you recursively follow it down, actually this is ubiquity I did, sorry. Um, there's about 751 lines in this file. Again, it's not easy to digest. So between what's in the R depends in germinate and what's here with app recursive depends, and you can sort of see what the node's position is in the tree above and below. So you've got the feeling of the scope and the positioning. What you don't have is um, seeing it in the context of the entire set. So there, these are some of the things that are there today, usable and there today. The other thing that's um, just basically put in was well, some tools just to basically diff the manifests in, an, in a coherent fashion. They're, everyone seemed to be writing a bunch of them <laughs> after I put one in place. I thought, you know, everyone seems to have their own little variant. Um, this one's available now in CD images um, tools. And they just basically, if it's equal, same binaries. Question mark is, you know, same package, different binaries. Um, if it's in one image or else if it's in the other image, it just indicates it that way in a fairly straightforward fashion. And then you can, by not counting, just looking at listing them, you can sort of see which actually ones are different in that, each of those cases. So that's a quick way, for, again, for doing the comparisons between what's happening between one image set and another image set. So that's the context of what's there, and this is where I don't have a solution. Um, I'm looking for ways of visualizing the impact of changing a package in the context of all seeded packages. So we're hitting main and universe, and we're hitting all of those um, 73 images. I'd like to be able to understand, okay, I'm touching this package, what's the scope of Ripple? And I'm looking for heuristics in that direction. The other thing that's a factor is this has to be able to be dynamically changing since the archive is changing. You know, it is changing pretty much every day between bug fixes, package updates, and so forth. And you know, main imports, moving things between main universe, adding things into the universe, all of that isn't static and fixed. So it's gotta be able to react to the system. And then we need to, as you see, consider the impact across the different release cycles when packages potentially are the same package across multiple cycles. So all in all, it's a rather interesting problem. I kind of like it. Um, I don't have a good solution yet for it, but you know, there's bits of it. Um, you know, luckily, there's an awesome release team 
Um, they're all experts in their field, and they've got a pretty good intuitive feel for what's happening. Um, but you get this lib, and you don't recognize it, and you're going like, OK, what's happening here? <laughs> and so this is um, the dimension. Um, there are some pieces out there to a solution. Um, some of the, as you can see, the, as you can see from some of those tools, um, you can get the full graph dependencies from germinate through the seeds. Um, you can basically take those graphs and overlay them to get a weighing. Something like that can well be done. The question then becomes is how do you display them effectively? And. Also, I think, you know, to a certain extent, we can create some tabular data based on the germinate R depends and the depends in order to use for prioritization. So that's probably a step we'll be going down. There's been various attempts at visual explorations that I found in the past. Um, these are the ones I've found. And then Mancusi, um, EDOS, is aiming at some similar things and has some similar tools. And so that's working with the Debian folk on some of that. Might be an area to explore. So. That is the pieces that I'm seeing, but I don't have a solution. So my, I guess, like I say, the question at this point is, um, thanks for anyone who, if anyone has you know, ideas. I'd like to thank people um, who've been participating um, and explaining a lot of the things to me. Um, particularly Colin Watson, who's done Germinate, and Steve, hang a sec. And then Martin and Adam, who are also on the release team, as well as many other members of the release team, um, they've been very, very, very patient with me with my um, questions as I've been sort of trying to understand what's been going on. As well as um, had some people basically helping me understand how the interaction works between Debian and Ubuntu and all the packages coming in and out. And then the various flavor leads from the various teams. Um, all of that is there. So um, with that, um, I guess it's a question of, does anyone have questions and ideas? And I've probably gone way too fast as usual. No, I'm okay? Okay, good. <laughs> um, so I guess it's at this point in time, it's sort of like, okay, does anyone have any good ideas for doing the visualization? Because that's uh, where we have, or does anyone have any specific questions about some of the stuff I've been talking about? So I hope you understood. The main problem isn't changes to code per se, but it's the spec file, the interdependencies between what happens when you... Yeah. Like I say, when it's one line code change and you're looking at that change going in, you can sort of make a judgment call. It, well, I've known some nasty one-liners that really had some bad effects, but for the most part, okay, you know, cleaning up punctuations, cleaning up things like that, simple. You're not going to be too worried. But like, you know, you've got 20, 30 lines of rather complicated code shipping as a patch. And you really only have like you know a few tries to spin the images and actually get them to work. Is it better to apply it or not? That's the question I'm having to deal with. Um, as well as okay, what should be re we be regression testing? If we change this, what else could be broken if, if at the system level? Uh, and assuming you can't write unit tests to cover ninety. Well, you can write packages. unit tests for the package, but you can't write unit tests for the interactions. Those yeah. are system tests, and the question then becomes is. How can you get that testing structure to get more solid? So what do you want your visualization um, tool to provide other than tiny ripples or enormous ripples? Uh, I'm open right now. Um, I, what I want to see is the context of the change. And so it's getting, figuring, getting a feel for the scope of the change. Um, you know, it changed GCC, okay? Potentially you, uh, you can impact pretty much the entire archive in some senses, or you know, glibc. Um, you change, uh, you know, a little um, utility that, you know, someone uses randomly and it's in the universe and, okay, fine. You know, that's pretty safe to chip put in because you're not going to, if it's got wrong, you're not going to affect too many people. And it's just basically getting assessment for, you know, that middle ground between those two extremes. You know, okay, this change is in and, you know, can we come up, start coming up with some metrics and make it a little bit more st structured? Okay. Hey, Trent. Back there. <laughs> oh. He's quick, isn't he? Very quick. Um, it, it seems to me that, that since you are attempting to do some kind of data mining approach, the, 
the obvious thing of trying to get an empirical um, idea of what bugs affect what is to look at the history in the bug tracking system, both the Launchpad 1 and the Debian 1, which has probably got a lot more history in it. Mm -hmm. um, and looking at things like what correlations you get between what package a bug was initially filed under and what it was finally filed under, because often mm -hmm. you'll get a bug yeah. filed against the package in which the symptoms appeared, but then as it's debugged, it'll move to the package where the problem was actually. And if you then sort of reverse that direction, that mm -hmm. gives you a potential predictive uh, That's a thing good point. about what bugs in with these packages tend to affect these packages, which, and then you can count those up and, and approach it that way. That's a good point. Um, yeah, I've seen the various ta bug tasks getting open against the same bugs against the different packages. And so looking and understanding the, the flow, the question then becomes, again, launch, mining launch pad then to basically pull out that package opening sequencing. That's a good point. Yeah. I'll make note of that. Thanks. Yeah, I was actually going to suggest something very similar to what David suggested about uh, mining the bug tracking system, but I thought a little bit more broadly, mining other distros by bug tracking systems, not just Debian, but okay. um, the, the Red Hat and the Mandrake and the whole lot, um, because it's quite likely that one of the other distros has already upgraded to the newer version. If you can, you'll need some pretty good heuristics to match up version numbers because the versioning schemes are a little bit different between distros. Yeah. But um, I imagine a, a few uh, regular expressions might be able to do a reasonable job of matching it. Um, and uh, if you can match up those and look at whether upgrading that package has historically caused breakage across a large number of packages, mm -hmm. or even better, if it can actually pull out whether upgrading to this particular version has led to a lot of breakage. And the other thing is, um, do data mining via Google searches. Um, uh, searching for that particular version number uh, okay. with the names of all of the packages that come out of the dependency process and mm -hmm. see if you get a lot of hits on that uh, for people basically who are on the bleeding edge have been upgrading manually. Um, it, it depends very much whether you want this to be a completely automated report generation or whether you want it to be input to a human decision. Um, uh, yeah. I, I would like it to be input to a human decision. So if it's input scoping. to a human decision, then mining out on Google searches and then bringing up the most likely hits um, may well give you something quite useful, okay. uh, which the human could then discard or, or you know, use. Okay. Uh, and the same with the data mining, the bug tracking system. But if you're trying to do a completely automated report, you'll get too many false positives, I imagine. Cool. OK, I'll go kick. Give me something to go play with in the next couple of talks. <laughs> Thanks. I didn't think about that. Excellent. Just a much more um, high-level thing about visualising the stuff rather uh -huh. than the nitty-gritty of gathering the data. Are you familiar with Gapminder? No. Ah, OK. Call it up sometimes. So the um, okay. ways of presenting multi-dimensional data that vary over time. Gapminder.org. There's some fascinating things there with um, economic data, but the, okay. they're based on animations. Uh -huh. So you can set going a series of data through time and see things move on a graph. And sure. it's often a very good way of visualising and finding complex multi-dimensional data and discovering something out of it. Gapminder.org. Thank you. Hey, just talking uh, directly on the dependency level, it sounds like um, if you want to say how important is this particular package based on its dependencies, that mm -hmm. sounds like the same problem as how important is this web page based on the links coming in, which of course leads you to a page rank algorithm. So how important are all links coming in and how important are the packages which have linked to us based on their links coming in? Mm -hmm. Along the lines of that? I'm, um, I'm part of the Mancusi project that you cited in, oh. uh, in your slides, yes. Okay, good. I want to chat <laughs> and, with you more. Uh, in the last three years, we did a lot of uh, research in, uh, in this area just to simplify the dependency graph. And we came out with uh, two interesting notions that you might uh, already know, the strong dependencies and the nominators. And this is a way, basically, to simplify the graph and uh, to remove all the noise that is in the dependency graph and find out exactly what you're looking for. If I modify this package, which are the all, all the other packages that are going 
to be impacted by these modifications. Oh. And we have tools and um, analysis uh, up on our websites that uh, work yeah. pretty well. And on, uh, the, on the other side, on the future, we also look at uh, how if, I, um, if this package moved from version 1 to version 2, mm -hmm. according to all the dependency constraint in our repository, which other packages are going to be Im impacted by this, uh, this migration. Yeah. And this is another tool that uh, it's uh, up on our website and uh, it might interest you that uh, exactly respond to these kind of questions. If I do an upgrade of a suite of a cluster of packages, for example GNOME, which are all the other packages that are going to be broken by this, uh, by this upgrade. Oh. So we are a lot moving in, in this direction of predicting and uh, try to uh, come up with automatic tools to, to help uh, software distributions. Very cool. Yes, thank you. Anything else? Any more questions? Speak now for a whole place. <laughs> <laughs> This is probably just more of a comment. Um, when you're analyzing the dependency graphs, you're kind of developing a scope of what the change is going to affect. But if you wanted to determine impact, use something like um, Debian's Popcon okay. database to see how many users. I mean, obviously something <coughs> like libc is going to affect everyone, yeah. so, but other kind of less common packages and so on. OK, Popcon. OK. I will go and start learning that like, part of it too. Cool. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. I think that's it. Uh, thank you very much, Kate Stewart. And we have got a, a little something for you. Just stay right there. Sorry. I shouldn't turn my back. We oh. present to you from Ballarat a gold plated penguin. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> thank you, Kate. Um, we have finished a little early, so we have a little, uh, we have a slightly longer break.